Hello and welcome to the diff. Um, so we've got good news and bad news today because the bad news is that today is the last day of the November diff. We've reached day five. Um, the good news is that we've got a diff favourite on with us to catch up over the next 20, 25 minutes or so and find out about how she's doing, the Safia Qureshi. Uh, my name is Seb and I'll be your host for this conversation. And just as much as Safia is very keen, I'm sure, to hear my questions, she also wants your questions. So if you're able to use our comment space on the right hand side of the video stream at thinkdiff.co to post your questions and comments there, feel free to, if you already navigated to the YouTube stream, feel free to drop them in that channel as well and, uh, and tweet us using hashtag thinkdiff, let us know what you think. And so today we're talking about reuse. We've got an example of reuse and example. It's a hot, in, in action, it's a hot topic, obviously, with everything that's being talked about plastics. And I've been in many sessions where we spent ages setting the scene for how not many plastics are collect collected or they're leaking into the oceans. And actually at the diff, we're all about talking about the positive actions that are actually happening. And that's what this session is about, because we're talking about an innovation in, in action called Cup Club that looks at the coffee cup scene. Um, and so probably the best first question, Safia, is what is Cup Club? Hi, excellent. So um, amazing to be back on uh, back on DIFF as always, and I'm kind of treating this really as a way to loop everybody back on our recent updates and exciting years. Um, so Cup Club, I'm, I'm founder and CEO um, at, of Cup Club, and we are developing up the future of packaging. Um, for us, that means delivering products that are high quality, returnable, reusable um, versus single use. So we're eliminating single use plastics and we've developed up a system to make it really easy for consumers to walk into their favorite cafe, order a beverage and take away in a reusable uh, cup and lid and be able to return that very easily when they're finished to a network. Um, network is these cases and you simply find one, you drop your product in, then you walk off and that's done. So we've developed that entire system. Um, we're starting with beverages, hence cup club. Um, we will be evaluating and looking at other products to add to the club system over time. But the most important thing is that all our products are connected to the web, um, which means that we know how many times they've been used, we know uh, where they are across the supply chain, and we can optimize that over time as well. So um, I think uh, what, we, what we're really passionate about is, of course, not just addressing the, C, uh, the plastics issue, but the CO2 issue as well. So. Um, when we started in the market, our first remit was to say, great, we're displacing all the single use plastics, but what does that mean from a data perspective? So when we launched Cup Club, we initiated a consultancy to, to develop up our life cycle assessment and we use half the amount of CO2 to all the single use options, including bio-based. So our clear strategy really is if you want to half the amount of CO2 and you want a better product, it has to be returnable and reuse. And just to break down that down for us, just in a couple more areas. So the idea is that this is reuse without you having, or me as a customer, having to carry around a cup with me right. all, exactly. all the time, anytime I fancy yeah. a coffee. Exactly. So we wanted to make this an easy, convenient solution for people to buy into. So the idea is that you walk into the store or a cafe as you always do. You make an order, you get an option to either take it away with Cup Club or a disposable. You scan a QR code that identifies who you are, and then you're able to take this product and leave. Um, when you're finished, you return it. So the whole idea is that you don't own it, you don't have to remember to bring it in, you don't have to wash it. Um, we think that that's a very sort of archaic approach in terms of um, that dependency on consumers to do all of the work is, um, I think a little bit too naive and that's why the adoption rates of people trying to bring in their own is so low, it's like 2%. Um, so what we're doing is we're somewhere in the middle, I would say. So if in one extreme you have all that disposable single use market and on the other extreme you have, I'm gonna bring in my own, we're somewhere in the middle where we're saying, great, we're, we're, we behave ex exactly operationally as single use, but you don't have to actually bring this thing in yourself somewhere between a paper cup and an urn. Um, and, and obviously just to, the other point that seems quite important to your business is this kind of information data using yeah. you know, latest tech. Yeah. 
that must be a massive value add for you as well in terms of making the product better because you're getting yeah. you get all this information back around like how it's being used where it's being dropped off where it's being picked up which you need to as a business so there are systems like this that have um, existed for a very long time so i'm sure the audience know about milk bottles and other types of glass bottle systems, returnable systems, and they've been fantastic. The, the downside a lot, uh, to a lot of those systems is that um, whilst they're brilliant at, I guess, um, eliminating single use, it's very difficult to know where your stock is at any given time. So as a manufacturer, you end up having to build a very, very large asset base of products and you sort of circulate them, but there's no real visibility of knowing where those products are. And so what we wanted to do would actually implement a system where we could layer it with technology and know, okay, our product is in this location of the city, or this is how much is in dirty, this is how much is in washing, and we can dynamically know um, what, what sort of level of service we're working at across every customer segment as well, um, and customer location. So we can say, listen, you're going to run out of stock, we should send you some more, or et cetera, things like that. So it enables us to optimize our operations. But it also actually enables us to really work with our users. So people who are um, really excited about using Cup Club can also then see what are the metrics. Me, For me as an individual, if I've had like, let's say over a course of a week, I've had 20 drinks. Um, what does that mean in terms of my outputs? So if I have used something that's half the CO2 to disposables, what does that mean in terms of the energy I have saved as a course of my own um, my, my participation in the club um, and what does that look like for me? So why do I care? So we use that data because we know on a per use basis how much CO2, energy, water, um, savings in plastic and paper we have per, per use. So we use that data to then give to end users and say, this is the equivalent of CO2 that you saved from entering the environment. This is the equivalent of plastics and paper reduction. So that's a really good way for us to balance out the the you know the value of what data can do for us and, and yeah i think that's something that comes up quite a lot with with reuse applications that ability to have a profoundly different relationship with your customer what yeah. uh, what's your what's your background how did you get into this how did you how did you get to this place where you're creating cups so i am an architect by background so my my approach is all about design um systems thinking service design um, bringing a lot of different complex components together and making it um, a sustainable, workable solution, um, working with different stakeholders, so from city level all the way down to your supply chain level. So this is what I've kind of done across the city from implementing and building buildings and master planning and uh, bringing different teams together to, to execute on a large industrial scale. Um, and I guess at Cup Club, it's about, it's it's a new system or service that removes the need for any sort of waste management, removes the need for purchasing single use plastic. So it's it's very relatable skill set that you can actually use in an, in an industry that really needs that kind of um, disruption. That it's, that. it's funny how often these stories highlight the value of interdisciplinary thinking. Because when I was hearing you talk, when you first said, oh, I was an architect, I was like, oh, actually, I didn't actually remember that fact about you. And I was thinking, oh, how did she get into cups then? But actually, when you went in to tell that story a little bit further, it's almost system design. And that's what, I guess, is yeah. a big part of the cup club model. Yeah, it is. And it's, it's core fundamentals of how do you, um, I mean, it is part of the sharing economy model. So we've, we've worked with these sort of systems for many, many you know, like years. Um, there are existing models out there, like I said, in the food and beverage industry, but also in other types of industry where you have a um, system. You don't, um, you don't, you know, pallets are a great example. So pallets are not something that are used the one time. They're in fact in constant circulation, and whoever has it is usually renting it uh, for that duration while it's with them, and then it moves on to a different person in the supply chain who then pays for it for that duration, and then it moves on. So um, yeah, this this is very relative thinking across an industry which. I, you know, I've, I've had a lot of experience and expertise in, so it's not, it's not something new. Um, what's new is, of course, the dynamics of specifically looking at plastics, specifically looking at packaging. Those are new dynamics, but we've had, we've had an excellent team to help us build that together. So that's been a very exciting journey. 
So I think the last time that we had you on during the diff, we had maybe not quite as uh, posh set up with the nice products all lined up on the desk, but you know, the, the concept was kind of demonstrated as a product designed product. Um, I think maybe you were even beginning to explore pilots or maybe done a couple of pilots. Yeah. Where, what's the story been sort of since that point of concept development to today? Yeah, so catch up on the last 24 months, basically. I think that was the last time you were on here. So two years ago. So the last two years trying to go from a uh, proven concept to a scaled business, I guess. Exactly. So funnily enough, two years ago, exactly now, we were at the Our Ocean Conference picking up our award from the EMF. Um, and that was that was our first um, initiation. Prior to that, we had prototypes and we had some pilots that we had conducted. Since then, we launched officially uh, in 2018, April, to industry, and then we announced our first customers um, and became operational from August 2018. And between then and now, we've served over about 210,000 drinks, and we've um, we're working across customers, including Google, Visa, John Wilson Partners, and a few other corporates, and we're launching across three cities next year um, in retail. Um, we've also won a string of awards since then as well. So we won the Next Gen Cup Challenge uh, from consortium brands, Starbucks, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Yum Brands, Wendy's, um, Nestle. And so that's meant that we've been working very closely with those businesses in terms of developing of a system that would work and be implementable across their um, main street, high street stores. Um, and we also recently won the best UX design um, 2019 by Fast Company, which has been fantastic. And then last week we won the Pitcher Palace Award. So, yeah, we've been busy. Sounds um, like you've won almost as many awards as me. Good. I'm glad. Um, um, but but just to dwell, because those are some big names that you've mentioned in terms of customers, yes. like Google, John Lewis, I'm yeah. particularly noted down. What does it mean when you say you're working with them? What does that look like? So customers, corporate customers for us are your average. We're serving about 50,000 drinks a month across our corporate customers. So we are um, servicing across their HQ offices in London on a daily basis. So they're customers. So, so the cafes at exactly. Google, what, exactly. some Google offices or whatever John Lewis offices exactly. those cups are the, like the cups we see on the desk exactly exactly yeah they're, they're literally um yeah they look exactly like this so um these are all connected <coughs> we've got our RFID technology built into all all products even the vids um so they're having their daily coffees and drinks across all those um, corporate sites um in canteens cafes self-serve points uh, we eliminate use um, packaging across all of those campuses. So they've gone 100% cup club. And now um, for as part of our next gen challenge, um, we've been working in San Francisco with Google um, and we'll be launching back there in 2020 next year. So that'll be exciting. Um, we haven't released information on exactly what that looks like. So bear, bear with us. Um, that press release will be coming out, I think, in the new year. So... So those are um, basically expansion of Cup Club into North America. Um, London is our obviously our HQ. London is where everything started, and there are other roadmap plans for for our retail launch in London as well, which we'll announce in the new year. Um, what else is there? I mean, there's there's a sort of leap really for for systems like ours is to with on the go um, experience like ours. We wanted to first affect the system and understand enough of the consumer requirements as well as um, the actual customer requirements or brand requirements within closed systems first and then move that into the retail space so that we had a good understanding of what those might look like when you start to scale that up. So yeah, so that's our 2020 vision, which is really exciting. Um, just to dwell on that city's point a minute for a minute, I know that you're not you, you you're not going to say anything about what you've you've got in plan. You're probably still working it up. But it seems like there's something real. There's, I feel like that was always part of the kind of story as well. There's an additional opportunity in the way in which city dynamics kind of work. It kind of speaks yeah. a bit to your background, and I guess there's there has to be this thing about well, if if you're living in London and could you be a member of a coffee cup solution that means you basically have reuse without a hassle of having to carry a reused cup around. Is that still the spirit of what you're looking at? 
Right. So exactly. I mean, it's it's essentially the opportunity for you to walk into your favorite cafe and walk out with your drink in one of these. Um, and all you need to do as an end user is just scan your QR code. So that's that's basically what we've done. We've built that technology. We're testing that technology now into new markets. Um, that now for us is um, from that from a product perspective side, it's actually quite straightforward. And the next steps really for us is to now focus on the ease of return. So what does that dynamic look like? How do we extend that network out? How do we grow that network over time? Um, who belongs- The ease of return kind of referring to like, you know, partly where do you put those boxes? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, these cases, exactly. So these cases generally we put into private sector um, owned um, and managed um, locations. So we're not leaving them outside on street corners. We're not, we're not just throwing them around in different parts of, of London or other cities. <laughs> that would be risky, probably. That would be, probably get shut down. So <laughs> that hasn't been our approach. Our approach has been very much about working with um, corporates and businesses, very much to engage them and involve them in that network. So, yeah, that's, um, I mean, everybody has very much, from a consumer point, um, everyone's very aware of the problem and they're trying to look for different ways to address and buy into solutions that they feel um, are speaking more in alignment with their values. And then from a corporate perspective, they want to be able to be seen to be doing the right thing. So, and and also making a very good um, statement about it. So there's, there's equal opportunity for both, I guess. I was going to ask a little bit about reaction. I mean, obviously... It feels like, I mean, do you, I mean, do you have any competitors, for example? It feels like you kind of work with, presumably you aim to work with almost everyone in the existing value chain. Like you work with, uh, you know, the existing coffee companies, you work with businesses. So it feels almost like you you walked into a space where, um, where you're collaborating with a lot of people. Sure. I mean, every, every product like ours, any, any kind of product which is new, you have to almost treat it as a, as a, as a two-way brand development process. So, you know, what is the, what is the core product? How can we make it so that it's tailored to your needs? Um, and then how do we make sure that it's easy and convenient for a user to come in or consumer to come in and take it away and leave? And it still carries all the requirements that you want it to. So there's always collaboration with, with, um, with customers in the sense that we, in innovation, you can't sort of just bombard them with a product that would you're hoping you know would fit fit in. We have we have started with products that we think can can definitely service a wide range of different types of customers, and then we offer them the opportunity to do develop and design their own, and we can run that system for them. Um, so it's less constrained on you have to use this, but um, also the, the the software element allows them to really sort of dig into personalization where they might want to add, you know, different elements. So it's, it's, it's constantly uh, collaborative in that way. I mean, these, you've got, you know, you've got major brands that have specific needs and each of them is very different. So you have to cater for them. Um, there's a question here online actually from uh, Scarlett and she's asking what's been the biggest challenge? So biggest challenge, I guess, for us has been around pricing. I think one of the things that makes things fly off the shelf is if you have a messaging that this is cheaper, um, cheaper than what you're currently using. That's usually the tactic with um, some early stage startups who will throw a lot of money and just say, right, okay, you know what, we'll bring the pricing so low, acquire so much of the market. Uh, we'll dominate it and then we'll see what happens after that so it's a different approach we've not we've we've sort of taken the route of we were set we're setting up our pricing as as required and we're not cheaper than single use cups etc but we are almost price comparative so if you look at a fully loaded cost of um, single use packaging plus any recycling recovery cost and then any tax and levy so we're quite equivalent where kind of, we can match that pricing, but we can't say we're going to save you X on your current, you know, single use plastics packaging. That's very, very difficult to do at an early stage. So I think the, the challenge really is for sometimes for, for brands, um, specifically in the food and beverage industry, the sensitivities to pricing is quite acute. 
um, even if it's a deviation of you know one cent of one pence, that seems to be um, a make or break. So I think that that why is one area of challenge. Um, the second is really from I guess um, marrying the 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 space between uh, or the communication between you know this is where the business is heading and this is where the brands um, these are their brand requirements and then this is where legislation and policy comes in and we find that legislation and policy in some parts of the world has been really really fantastic and helpful and in other parts of the world actually isn't moving in the direction or as what would be an example of of like a enabling piece of legislation that makes it easier to do something like that is it is it some of the typical environmental regulations or are there specific things in the cup or coffee industry or the hot beverages industry right so i mean um simple levies and taxes and bans on single-use plastics um we've seen mm. a really positive development in america um following um last year's Canadian, uh, in fact, this year's policy change around single use plastics and what's going to happen in, in the course of that. And that has re- definitely seen um, a lot new, more competitors enter the market. So you asked about, you know, what does a comp- competition la- landscape look like? And that's a healthy response. I think if you, if you have legislation, you have, and that's the only way we're going to get out of this entire crisis is that, legislation plays a very clear way for determining how industry will need to react. Without that, industry won't react, and that we know that very well. So if we are trying to collaboratively work towards a, a roadmap of reducing, let's say, um, you know, the amount of single-use plastics in circulation by 2025, that means that all the stakeholders have to be involved. That includes legislation, that includes industry, that includes which is startup community or early stage businesses. So um, where there are, you know, single use plastic bans, uh, where there are um, reduction requirements on single use plastics, or where there are clear levies and taxes on specific items that are single use plastics, that has really helped in driving the need and the requirement to procure services like ours. So we find that we are being pulled into certain markets because of legislation really implementing and playing a big um, a big factor in that. Right, I've got two more good questions in from the audience actually, and I've also got one of my own. So let's uh, let's get through them. Question from um, Stephen, and he asked, um, when did you realize you had something? What, when was that, I guess he's looking for, when was that moment when you thought to yourself that actually you, you had a generally innovative product that was gonna hit the market? Um, was think, there a moment, I suppose, as well as a question? Yeah, where, was that, where was that moment? Uh, well, I mean, these proof points, what, it's, it's basically what you're describing as proof points. What were your validation points? Um, so as a founder and as a designer, your validation points come in many, many phases. There's no one thing that says, yep, that's great. I mean, it, it happens incrementally. So the first validation point when I, when Cup Club was, you know, this was um, in, early 2016 um, when it was just an idea and I sort of headlined it at a design conference. The first validation point came from somebody who's pretty uh, fantastic and um, who became one of my mentors who was actually in the audience who afterwards said, this is fantastic, you should come and meet my team. Um, Validation points or proof points come when somebody who has a lot of, I guess, visibility or understanding of maybe your space or the value that it might bring and gives you the green light, that's one. Second validation is, of course, winning awards from established bodies that include the EMF and Closed Loop Fund as part of Next Gen. That's another validation point. Um, other validation points or proof points have been where we have presented Cup Club to a, a potential customer and the customer has said, we've tried to implement a system similar to yours without this, 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 and failed, and we need to use your product. Um, I was going to say, surely the moment when a big business like John Lewis someone says, yeah, we'll take X amount or whatever, that's the big moment. Yeah, exactly. Customers are validation points. Um, there are many, and you, you sort of, as you grow your product and you grow your service, you'll have diff- you know, different validation points. So, um, are looking to join your team for example who have like amazing skill set and they want to 
be a part of it. That's another validation point that you're doing something great. So, yeah, um, it takes time. I mean, if you are in the right place, right time, you'll see that your product or service suddenly moves fast. And that's that's a good sign. If, if it's moving up to the right, that's a good sign. Um, hopefully, a practical question uh, coming from Freya, who's just asked, how, you know, how, how do you get involved in Cup Club? If you're a regular person right now, I guess the, that will depend a bit on whether you work in certain places at the, at the moment. But I presume they could also go and follow you on various channels or your website or whatever if they wanted as well. So in many ways, um, we are always looking for really smart people to join our team. So um, job offer, Freya. Yeah, exactly. Send send your details if you're you know, super smart and buzzy, and you're you know you're up for joining us in various areas. You know, we always keep a lookout, so email talent at cupclub.com. Um, otherwise, look out for our retail launch in London in 2020. We will be making announcements across our social networks. We're very prolific across Twitter and LinkedIn right now because our, most of our customers are corporates, but we are going to be moving more and more into um, some of the other social platforms. So you'll start seeing more engagement there. And then... Um, Thirdly, of course, support us online and you know test the product out and give us your feedback. We'd love to hear from you there. Um, so yeah. That's so it. final question from me. Um, you kind of like, well, often we like to finish these sessions. You may remember that we like to say what's next. That's our sort of ta typical um, com um, conversation ender. But yeah. you've kind of given us a bit of a, tea a taste of what's next already in terms of some of the launches that you've got lined up yeah. for 2020. What I'm kind of interested in though. Um, and it's something I'm always interested in when I have conversations with people who are already in a business or in the process of developing a business from an entrepreneur angle is how far are you looking ahead? How much of it is, what am I going to do tomorrow? Because that's kind of, you know, what you've got to do. Yeah. And how much of it is the big picture of what you're actually doing in terms of, you know, the, disrupt the disruption right. you're bringing? Right. So, I mean, what's next for us is over the next 18 months, our focus is, of course, um, expanding um, our drinks service across multiple brands, international brands, Fortune 500 businesses that I named out. Um, then with them working a roadmap ahead as well. So with your, your customers are your roadmap. So you sort of ask them, right, what is next for you? What's, um, what, what other things would be exciting and what would be interesting for you uh, moving forward? So, we have had a lot of interest in terms of what are the other product categories that you need uh, or could you service beyond drinks. So we know that the, the system we built very successfully, we know how it works. We, we know, you know pretty much how it's um, going to be designed for scale. So the next thing that really is, okay, what are the other products that we can add to the system? So would they be food boxes? Would they be other types of drinks, containers, et cetera, et cetera. So that's um, part of our R&D Club. So again, if you're an engineer and you're super excited about joining Cup Club, um, that would be a really exciting space that we would then engage and work together on. So we have we have a few things in the pipeline to to really like discover what those next. Uh, Still very are. much keeping your head um, above the parapet a little bit to uh, see beyond uh, beyond next week and next month, which is. Um, which I guess means it's still a very exciting time to be part of the business. Well, uh, thank you so much for giving us some time this afternoon, uh, Safia. Yeah. And thank you so much to you at home or in your offices who have been uh, posting those questions and comments online. It is the last day of the diff. All this content, of course, is available to watch afterwards. So, you know, keep thinkdiff.co in your favorites boxes or follow, subscribe to the foundation and the McCarthy Foundation's YouTube channel to catch up on various sessions. Um, we do have a session at three o'clock that uh, might be of interest to you, which is why it's time now to invest in the circular economy. We've been talking to a couple of startups this morning. Now we're talking about how, what, you know, why there's sort of investment momentum. And we're talking to um, Intesa Sao Paulo, a big Italian bank who has some cool stuff in that space. So do join us again at the diff. And thanks so much for joining this session.